Welcome to Story Collider. Yeah! <laughs> awesome. So my scientific and educational journey starts halfway across the world in the Horn of Africa. See, I was born and raised in Eritrea, uh, which is a beautiful country on the Red Sea coast. Um, it's a place of remarkable beauty and diversity of people and natural environments in every way that you can imagine. But it also happens to be in part of the world that's been rocked, rocked by conflicts for generations. So that, you know, kind of conflicts have influenced my scientific journey. Um, this is a reality in my part of the world because for us, we lived with wars, right? For most people, wars are what you hear about in the evening news. For, but pretty much all of my life's milestones are marked by wars. I was born at a time when there was a, an armed coup d'etat that removed the then leader. Um, there was an act of war raging to liberate Eritrea from Ethiopian occupation at that time. So even though I grew up in the capital city, away from most of the conflict that was happening in the outskirts, um, it was not uncommon that even for the capital city to be bombed and you have to experience these large um, kind of events like that. And I'm talking about the kind of bombs, you know, that rock an entire city and leave behind vivid, very loud sounds of bombs going off somewhere, rocking an entire city, breaking windows across the region, literally, um, right? And bombs falling on military depots and burning, uh, you know, the entire establishment, um, leaving behind, you know, again, those kind of vivid imageries of mushrooms of fire, clouds run going into the sky. Um, and so it was hard to escape from that kind of thinking, right, reality. But through all that turmoil, somehow found my way to science, and I give all of that credit for that to my parents. Um, who tried their best to make sure that the wars and the political instability did not derail our education. Did their best to fill the house with books, um, impress upon us that we have to read, we have to learn about the world around us. Um, and did their very best for us to believe that education is the only lasting wealth in this life. And hence, um, we kind of need to focus on that. Um, so that kind of drove me to like school, I loved school, and hence, I, in 1991, which just happened to be the year that Eritrea was liberated and became an independent country, I was admitted to the university, and I was one of a thousand students that entered the university at that year, and we only had one university. So there were only a thousand students from the entire country able to go to, to university. Um, and when I got there, I took a course in introduction to soil science. And I'm about 18 year old at that time. I knew nothing about soils really. Like most people at that age, you don't really know the science of soil, right? But then I started learning about the nature and properties of soil and the incredible ecosystem services that we derive from soil and that the soil actually is the habitat for remarkable diversity of life and even makes our own life possible, right? And I was hooked. Started learning about soils then, and I haven't stopped since. Um, and then somewhere along the line, um, I really started thinking about land degradation. And I started learning more and more about the issue of land degradation and the global crisis um, that this issue brings. Um, and so when I went on for my master's studies here in the US, I decided to make that the focus of my studies. And specifically, I sought to study the land degradation issues associated with armed conflicts. And I chose landmines. Um, and these two issues, mind you, are not necessarily always discussed together, right? When we talk about land degradation in the realm of soil science or environmental science, we're typically talking about soil erosion or nutrient depletion or other problems associated with agricultural intensification, deforestation, and things like that. And when you hear about armed conflicts, you're typically hearing about humanitarian crisis, right? 
So we never do actually l discuss these things, it seems, um, together. But they're very related. And to me, because of my background, these are two things that I always kind of um, wanted to explore further, and this was a great opportunity to be able to think about them together. And so I decided that I was going to use my master's thesis um, for a way to understand this landmine crisis further. And I specifically tried to address a couple of really important issues. One is I really wanted to be able to identify and document the main forms, types, and impacts of landmines that actually cause land degradation. And then I wanted to develop a unifying framework that would enable us to think about how these weapons of war actually cause and perpetuate environmental degradation. And, and you might wonder at this point, why landmines, right? Of all things that wars involve, why landmines? And I picked landmines because landmines are incredibly common, cheap, relatively very cheap. A piece of, one landmine typically costs about $3, weapons of war, but they're extremely long lasting. And they also happen to be weapons of mass destruction. Landmines have killed more people in the world and injured more people than chemical and nuclear weapons combined. Um, at some point, there were about 800 people being killed by landmines every week. Another 1,200 people being injured. So this was a really tro global crisis that was actually affecting large members of the human community around the world. But then again, if you didn't live in those conflict zones, you didn't really know much about this problem. So through my master's research then, I sought out to study this issue. And in particular, I was able to demonstrate that the main you know, kind of mechanism by which landmines cause land degradation is one, by denying large number of people around the world access to their land that they actually depend for food and for their livelihood. And then, every time a landmine explodes, it, it physically disrupts the structural stability of the soil. Add to that the fact that whether they explode or not, landmines being in the soil means that they continue to leach toxic chemicals in the form of TNT, RDX, and a range of heavy metals. All of this means that a large part of the world is inaccessible and is getting degraded. Just to give you an idea of the enormity of this problem, removing mines from just a quarter of the land that's currently affected by landmines and assuming a very modest rate of productivity of that soil, we can produce enough food to feed 1.6 million people every year. So this is now not just a problem that is humanitarian because it kills or maims people, but denies people a right to live, a right to be able to feed themselves and their families, and it destroys the environment in the process. So, but as you can imagine, doing this work, every part of this work is completely, very, very complicated, right? One, doing field work with anything that involves these kinds of weapons is extremely dangerous. And second, nobody actually knows exactly how many mines are out there. Nobody knows where they are. Typically, when wars end and opposing militaries go home, they don't leave behind maps to lead people to where these mines are. They don't tell us how many they put in the ground. Right? And these are extremely long-lasting weapons. Um, a big portion of the current landmine crisis can be traced back to World War II and wars that happened in the 70s and since then. And add another wrinkle to this issue in that most countries around the world are signatories to international treaty that actually seeks to ban the use of landmines, including the Convention on Conventional Weapons and the International Campaign to Ban Landmines Treaty. This is such a big political advocacy issue on the global stage that the international campaign to ban landmines, a group of international NGOs that came together to form it, 
they actually won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997. But it still remains an issue, right? And um, another kind of really important lesson that I learned in this process is also how important it is to effectively frame your issue, right? Especially for something like this. Um, for most people, and in most political arenas, landmines are treated as a humanitarian medical crisis, right? Um, and that's because it's extremely effective to be able to use this kind of humanitarian framework because it allows people that are so far removed from the problem to be able to empathize with the victims and hopefully be compelled to action, right? The kind of image that you all would have gotten when I started talking about landmines and their damage is probably something like head of a household being killed by mines, right? Or a kid playing in the field whose legs get, it would get blown away and then he or she having to live the rest of their life as an amputee. Those are extremely horrifying and very, very powerful images. Right? Those kind of issues and frameworks compel people to action. But, the, but you kinda, when you see it from the filter of an environmental scientist, though, as horrifying as those, those images are, they don't even tell the whole story. Right? There's a whole other set of the problem that's not getting international recognition or the kind of attention that it deserves because we are so fixated on this humanitarian framework. And hence, we're not actually recognizing the long-term scourge that these weapons cause and the long-term suffering of communities, the natural environment getting destroyed, and societal development also that suffers because of these landmines. All of those could have been captured from an environmental framework, though, right? So as a scientist, then, when you're doing this kind of work, it's extremely frustrating, right? I have no control over the kind of political forces that shape these kind of frameworks and movement agendas. But at least doing the kind of work that I did, um, I found it to be consequential more than anything that I've ever done as a scientist because at least I'm able to convey a message of how these relatively cheap, easily accessible, very widely used weapons cause very long-term environmental damage with significant consequences for societal and regional development. And I think this work remains as a somber reminder that the horrors of war are very, very long-lasting and widespread. Thank you. <laughs>